Sir, you can start. Yeah. yeah. Hello, good evening and welcome to the IIRSI webinar, Trebuchlectomy Step by Step. Today we have a great faculty with us, Dr. Sunita Dubey, who will be also moderating with me, Dr. Ganesh Vakataraman, Dr. Madhu Bhaduria, Dr. Murli Ariga, Dr. Reena M. Chaudhary. So with this uh, great faculty, we are going to have a great session, I hope so. We are not going to have a format uh, like a lecture or something, but going to discuss various aspects of the each step of trabeclectomy so that viewers can know the final details and tips on tricks of each. So as a customary, I will just uh, have a, we'll have a short introduction of our faculty. I'll just share my uh, slides. So welcome to the trabeclectomy step by step. Uh, with us, we have Dr. Sunita Dubey, who is a very known, renowned specialist. He'll, uh, she'll be also moderating with me. She did her fellowship in glaucoma at Wills Eye Hospital of Philadelphia in 2002. She has extensive experience in the management of pediatric refractive secondary glaucoma and having a special interest in GDDs and MIGS. Extensive experience in training and fellow and DNB students. She has more than 100 publications of which 60 are PubMed indexed and book chapters in peer and non-peer reviewed journals. She has received several prestigious awards in AIUC, including ET Salvam Award, Best Paper Award in Ophthalmic Education Epidemiology and Prevention of Blindness section and Best Oral Paper Award at International Congress of Glaucoma Surgeries. She has been reviewer of various prestigious peer reviewed journals. She is a member of AIUS NMBH National Committee for setting off ophthalmic standards. She is a member of Glaucoma Task Force, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. She has been nominated as honorary professor by Indian Medical Association in August 2017. She has been a treasurer of Glaucoma Society of India for year 2001, 12 to 2014. Over to Dr. Sunita Dube. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Arora, for the kind introduction. So at the outset, I would like uh, to thank you for giving us this opportunity to discuss and share the pearls of glaucoma, uh, the trabeculectomy, with a team of experts which are excellent surgeons. And trabeculectomy, as we know, is one of the most important procedure and the most time-tested procedure in our armamentarium. Uh, although the numbers are decreasing across the world, but in India, it is still the most commonly performed procedure. So it's very important to know the right technique. Uh, a lot of variations and modifications have taken place uh, over a period of years in terms of techniques and use of anti-metabolites uh, to make it more safer, effective, and predictable. So today's plan, as uh, uh, told by Dr. Arora, is to break down the surgery into individual steps. And uh, each expert will share their experience because all of us have different techniques of performing and improving our own success. So uh, now it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Vinod Arora, who is the director of Nav Jyoti Eye Hospital, Dehradun Wave Lessig Center. And he is currently the president of IIRSI and vice president, a past president of uh, North Zone Ophthalmic Society. He is the chairperson of scientific committee, uh, UK SOS. And he has published over 25 papers in national and international journals and presented over 700 papers in national and international uh, conferences and won the best national best paper award in DOS 2000 and won IR, IIRSI gold medal at Chennai in 2017. So he is the moderator for today's session. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Dr. Ganesh Raman who is heading the glaucoma clinic at Arvind Eye Hospital. So he completed his fellowship in glaucoma from Arvind Eye Hospital in 2005. And he has done observation in glaucoma at various prestigious institutes um, abroad, like Wilmer Eye Institute and uh, Baskin Palmer Eye Institute and in Germany as well. 
and uh, uh, he joined Arvind Eye Hospital as consultant in 2005. He has uh, his at its, his credit 30 publications in national and international journals and contributed chapters in various textbooks in ophthalmology. He was the South Zone Glaucoma India Education Program Coordinator, during which he uh, conducted several CME programs in two and three tire cities for the benefit of general ophthalmologists to enhance uh, their practice in glaucoma. And he has a lot of surgical experience. So now over to you, Dr. Arora. Thank you. It's my pleasant duty to introduce Dr. Kalan Madhu Bhadaruya. She is uh, an institution and rebuilder of Sitapur Eye Hospital. Once we were doing our graduation and post graduation, we know Sitapur was having a very good reputation at that time. I think Dr. And it lost its glory after some time uh, when we came into the practice, but Dr. Madhuri has taken over and she probably revived everything and make it a, one of the most respected hospital in North India. Currently, she's the director and CM of Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, I Hospital Sitapur. She's an alumnus of KG uh, Medical College Lucknow and Shankar Nitrala Chennai. She served in the armed forces for 25 years. And we are as from FMC Pune. Uh, presented and published nationally and internationally. She is working in the glaucoma for, for the last 30 years and performed all sorts of the treatments and management. She received multiple awards for excellent healthcare and SEH from within 2020, ICSA Lobart and PMG, et cetera. So welcome Dr. Madhu Madhuria. Our next uh, renowned faculty is Dr. Murali Aregia. He is a senior glaucoma consultant and medical doc uh, director of Swami Eye Clinic at Chennai Glaucoma Foundation, Chennai. Also, he is the head of department of Sundra Medical Foundation and Research Academics Director at MNI Hospital Chennai. He has been trained at Western RIO Ahmedabad and observed fellowship at Scales Hospital, CMC Valor, New York, New York Eye and Ear Infirmary, New York, USA. He has three decades of experience in the diagnosis of perimetry, spectaculosity, and management of glaucoma. He has made numerous presentations at national and international meetings as keynote speaker, faculty, panelist in glaucoma at USA, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Singapore, Russia, and World Glaucoma Congress. He has more than 30 peer-reviewed publications, teaching CDs and automated perimetry and glaucoma surgery chapters in textbooks, and glaucoma and AIOS ready Ragnar also. He has received several best paper and top video awards in GSI and AIOS meetings. He is actively involved in teaching PGs in ophthalmology and optometry in Chennai, and conducts glaucoma instructional courses at various meetings. Besides being a reviewer of the ophthalmic journals, he has been the managing director, editor of the Journal of Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association. He was the treasurer of the Glaucoma Society of uh, India from 2008 to 2010, and executive committee member of the Madras City of Ophthalmic Society Association, besides participating in several Glaucoma India education program meetings, etc., and across the country. So welcome Dr. Murli Aragya with us. Uh, Dr. Sunita, please. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dina Chaudhary, uh, who is working in the field of glaucoma and cataracts in the last 20 years at Eye Care, Eye Hospital and PG Institute. And presently, she is a director of glaucoma services at Eye Care. She is an active speaker at many national international conferences with various national international publications in peer-reviewed journals and numerous chapters in the textbooks. And she also authored a book on interpretation of visual fields. Uh, she is, has been involved in mentoring young postgraduates uh, and leads the glaucoma fellowship program at IKRI Hospital and has been a part of national international glaucoma clinical trials. So her area of interests and expertise include imaging in glaucoma diagnosis, glaucoma lasers and surgery, uh, managing complex glaucoma and cataract, and glaucoma drainage devices and ologen implant surgeries, and also pediatric cataract and glaucoma management. So she, I know she is an excellent surgeon and uh, hope that we will have a very good discussion with this esteemed faculty. So are you going to show the, uh, start the video? Yeah, well, I think we should just tell the format. 
we are going to have a surgery step by step and we'll discuss each and every step of it so before starting i think we should have a just general questions uh whether we should stop any medicine before starting surgery or what what are your uh, precautions we take uh, before starting the surgery over to you dr sudita so yeah as rightly said i think case selection pre op workup and even post op management is as important as the surgery itself so i would like to know from uh, each of you like what factors do you consider while taking up before taking up the patient for surgery in terms of uh, history examination anticoagulants you know starting of steroids and uh, other histories like contact lens wear and uh, systemic conditions which are very very important factor factors for the success of trabeculectomy so uh, can we uh, start with uh, uh, with dr madhu all right so uh, glaucoma patients who have had glaucoma for a long time or those who are freshly diagnosed and they are undergoing surgery means chronic for multiple years and people who are fresh they will have to be in two categories because the chronic ones have very fiery red conjunctiva so first we take the fresh ones which are simpler if patient is on anti any anticoagulants or a patient is a cardiac or hypertensive or a diabetic physician referral is a must and they have to be stopped in consultation with the physician and not by ophthalmologist himself because the risk factor if anything goes wrong stays with that and it's not a cataract it's not a clear corneal incision so therefore anticoagulants will have to be stopped for some time if the conjunctiva is healthy then basically echo suppressants as far as possible which have a long term effect like beta blockers should be definitely done away with and also if it's it's a little reddish i then maybe we can take off the crossed group of drugs and take the patient for a short while on the oral uh, uh, dimox or something like that so the pressures are all right but the conjunctiva is more comfortable and the patients who are on long term drugs definitely steroids should be given the topical steroids should be given at least 3 4 days in advance so that the conjunctiva becomes quiet along with withdrawing the drugs which are possible to withdraw it's not always possible to withdraw we whatever you say in theory but actually on the ground is not always possible to withdraw too many drugs so we can withdraw some which are feasible because at the time of trabeculectomy we really need to have fresh iop which are good iops high pressure trabeculectomies are not really such a safe option so reduce what you can add steroids if there is inflammation if any systemic condition to be controlled and physician referral is definitely before Give, uh, stopping any kind of anti uh, anticoagulants. Doctor Rina, do you have any different approach if you're dealing with the primary versus secondary glaucomas? Yeah, so I think Doctor Madhu pretty much covered everything. But uh, two things I like to usually look out for: one is on the slit lamp examination. I like to see what the conjunctiva is looking like, not just how congested it is or how angry it is, but also the mobility in the superior area where I'm planning my trabeculectomy. Also, the type of glaucoma you're dealing with, whether it's an angle closure, open angle, a fakey eye. So one has to plan accordingly. Sometimes you have a very shallow anterior chamber eye, which is an angle closure eye, needs trabeculectomy. there again the planning has to be different so whether it's high risk or not such questions have to be answered conjunctival mobility is an important thing and whether it's a deep set eye or not sometimes even the exposure of the superior conjunctiva or wherever you're going to plan you know you might have a scar there you might want to choose a superior temporal so location figure out where you're going to work and look at the conjunctival health conjunctiva and tenons are the key anatomical structures for the success of trabeculectomy over time as far as the anti glaucoma medications are concerned where possible and where you think the conjunctiva is taking a beating because of chronic use yes it's good to stop and put them on diamox and take them up for surgery but sometimes it's not possible so i put them on topical steroids for 4 5 days and take them up okay so very tightly uh dr ganesh uh, how do you how much pressure do you want uh, you know before surgery if the patient pressure has been very high because we do uh, we operate in most of the cases where the pressures are pretty high uncontrolled pressures because the patient presents to you with potty pressure and uh, maybe the second day glaucoma so what approach uh, you know before surgery before surgery oh, definitely that yeah uh, op- yeah opening opening the eye at such high pressures uh, does lead to certain complications especially we are worried most about the supracranial hemorrhage which can occur on table or even later also so we preoperatively 
prime the eye with uh, intravenous mannitol when you are operating at such high pressures. So that's something which we always uh, keep in mind. We write in our notes and it's given. And depending on the stage of the patient and the intraocular pressure, we could go up to even 200 ml. Once you're given that, we have to make sure the patient is always flat on the bed. He has time to go to the restroom and back because the surgery is going to get prolonged. And the, intra, the air conditioning in your uh, you know, theater is going to be so cold that he is going to have a tendency to uh, you know, uh, go to the restroom. So you have to prime all that and then plan accordingly. So all these things have to be taken care of uh, when you plan for. Uh, and of course, I agree with Dr. Reena and Dr. Madhu. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's very, very important that the bladder should be empty before you take up the uh, you know, patient on the table. Otherwise, you know, he'll put pressure and uh, you will have um, all kinds of complications. How, how much time do you wait uh, after putting penitol? So we do? usually, uh, uh, we have a stretcher system. So the patient goes to the restroom. We wait about half an hour to one hour. And even if you give it about even one hour early, it doesn't really matter. The idea is that the pressure will be low. It works for quite some time, especially if the glaucoma is non-inflammatory, if it's primary. If it's inflammatory glaucoma, make sure you give it only once because the blood uh, retinal barrier is breached. The mannitol particles can go into the vitreous cavity and cause a rebound intraocular pressure rise. So all this has to be planned uh, uh, just before. But we do it about one, one and a half before. Do you use pilocar also before surgery or it's not required? Uh, we avoid pilocarpin. It brings the lens iris diaphragm forward. And uh, even if the chamber is not uh, shallow, it will make the chamber shallow. So we avoid pilocarpin uh, before and after surgery. But so the important news about pilocarpin. Yeah. yeah, sometimes because cataract patients are lined up for surgeries and there is there are errors. So we like to highlight do not dilate. We don't use pilocarpin, but we write do not dilate on these files. Sometimes in general practice, I think it's not a bad idea to make sure you highlight it for your nursing staff and other people who prepare the patients. And if it, if it all the pupil gets dilated, don't blame your staff because the block itself can dilate the pupil. <laughs> Dr. Moodley, uh, the question to you about the block, about the block as we are talking about that, we know that large amount of peri, uh, you know, butter block can be hazardous to the health of the optic nerve. So what kind of block do you use or you do not use any block or just tell us about the type of anesthesia you use for these patients? Yeah, I think most often my favorite has been to use the, uh, the peribulbar, which is the uh, simplest to use. And uh, peribulbar has been my favorite. I invariably give a peribulbar, but I have sometimes tried the subtenance. But invariably, somehow the subtenance invariably tends to give a lot of subconnectable hemorrhage and... Uh, uh, cumbersome to do for somebody who's been doing peribulbar for years. So I generally prefer a 4 to 6 ml peribulbar uh, injection. And uh, you will find that sometimes because the patient has been on glaucoma medication for a long time, the uh, prostaglandin related periopitopathy makes the eyelid skin quite tight. So as, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, giving in a little bit of steroids to sort of quieten the eye. And of course, be prepared for the tight skin and the tight eyelid when you're uh, dealing with the uh, block itself. But my favorite has been to give the peribulbar. Very rarely I do uh, subtenance, but uh, almost always I do peribulbar. So what precautions, because generally, uh, like we've seen peribulbar being given inferotemporally as well as superonasally. So would you give at both the places or just inferotemporally? Because when you give superonasally, a lot of chemosis and... It is closer to the optic nerve also. So what you, will you suggest? Most often, I think it is adequate. Most often, it is adequate to give inferotemporal alone. Most often. But sometimes you can supplement it with a supranasal injection as well. And I don't really see the... Suppose you are a fair... With a fair experience, I think you can uh, do well with the supranasal as well. And the volume of the injection should not be too high. You should know where you are injecting and withdraw before you inject. And uh, the, the inferior temple is the safest, of course. The supranasal is not wrong to do, but if in an inexperienced hands, probably it's best to avoid the supranasal. Yeah. So, any so, difference so of opinion? Is given or... well, does really well. Subtenant doesn't really cause hemorrhages unless until it's not given well. Gi given well, subtenant is as good as peribulbar in any situation. And uh, definitely, we are not really putting so much of pressure on the optic nerve as well as we are not 
uh, putting a patient at risk of perforation because as Sunita said in your hands, whatever you say, it's, it's not something that doesn't happen. We all know in 10,000 one case, but for that patient, one case is one. I yeah, I like to highlight that I, I, if, if possible, adrenaline in the block because sometimes no. it uses the blood yes. supply to the optic nerve. So we don't use adrenaline. And also we like to make sure we avoid retrobulbar. So we use shorter needles. Yeah. 26 gauge needle or something for peribulba and also in trained hands so that if possible as far as possible we avoid subconjunctival hemorrhage because we know the hemorrhage in that area also brings about yes. scarring post-operatively and no pinky no pressure so it's just a gentle injection and weight you can just give a very little pressure if required along the orbital rim but don't try and pressurize the eye and peribulba not retrobulba so mostly you don't want to see the pupil dilate on the table making sure that you've not gone into the retrobulbar stage to try and well, should be small uh, if if i may can okay. add uh, we have in arvind we have shifted uh, all the blocks to subtenance i would agree with dr madhu we, we, have, agree, uh, we have shifted all the <laughs> what about the subconjunctival uh, subconjunctival only if you some people do it but it's not so comfortable as we Fair. Some people are even putting MMC with subconjunctival also there. Ha, so that's what it's not very comfortable. That's about it. Patient may not be comfortable at that time. Yeah, yeah. I think the volume should be low. That one point is very clear. Volume and should be low. Yes. Whatever. No volume, do. no pressure, no adrenaline. No. Yeah. So all of us agree that we can give peribulbar block, but the volume should be low. Yeah. 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 As far as possible, it should be given in temporally only. Avoid superior temporal and very gentle massage. Don't put a lot of pressure. And I think whosoever is blocking should be warned that the patient is having advanced glaucoma and uh, should be handled very carefully. But other choices are like people are giving uh, subtenance and even subconjunctival. I uh, not to be know that I think subconjunctival can also be given if the patient is cooperative. And uh, um, but uh, I think okay, caution should be taken not to cause subconjunctival hemorrhage, especially because we are going to give the subconjunctival in the quadrant where we are going to operate. So I think that is very important. I would just like to add one point regarding the conjunctival mobility. So I, what I usually sometimes most often do is uh, just to ensure conjunctival mobility even preoperatively and decide where to cite the trabeclectomy, whether it's superior, supranasal, or superior, wherever you want to do. Generally, we try to avoid supratemporal and the temporal, of course. Supratemporal, because suppose you're going to do a retrab or planning for a cube or something. Subsequently, you better to leave the one, one quadrant alone for future surgery and so on. Second is to even uh, put in a subconjunctival saline or subconjunctival BSS uh, to elevate the conjunctiva to see how much of the blood you are going to actually elevate before the surgery. This was taught to me by... Uh, Dr. Sridhar Rao and Dr. L. L. Vijaya and all that. So they, they, they invariably lift up the conjunctiva to see the mobility and how much you can dissect. That actually is very useful. And now many of us even give the subconjunctiva mitomycin as uh, you know, was pointing out. to do the injection to elevate the conjunctiva. The second thing is doing a gonioscopy is important to locate, especially in secondary glaucoma, the presence of sinicae, how much of closure, where to actually do the iridectomy, whether you have neovascularization or some iris anomaly and so on. Agonioscopy also is useful for you to plan the site of the trabeclectomy, especially in secondary glaucoma. Yeah, I think these points, the careful examination is very yeah. important. Full, full careful examination yeah. is required. So it's not only conjunctiva. Each and every structure is yes. important when it comes to it. So the question of your secondary glaucoma is actually was not probably addressed what you asked for was probably you wanted this thing that if there is secondary glaucoma, the primary disease and glaucoma both have to be managed independently. Mm -hmm. And it's only when both of them are controlled, we resort to surgery. So whether it's like levity yeah. glaucoma, NBG, they all have different protocols for preoperative management, how much steroids to give, Evastin to give or whatsoever. Yeah. But all of them have different protocols. Maybe we can't cover in this one hour. Yes, the important I, I point to remember is that manage the disease plus the glaucoma both. Yes. And yes. they should not be conflicting with each other in their treatments. So the management of primary and secondary glaucomas are very, very different. And very different. Trabeculectomy is also very different in both yes. glaucoma. So you have to take extra caution. And we are going to discuss subsequently in our surgical steps what... Uh, uh, you know, how will you improve the success at each and every point? So, yeah. the, uh, the video now. I'm going to share the video now. Yeah. 
So, uh, so basically, we are going to shoot two video. One very small one. This is a uh, approach from uh, Ornix. So this is a limbal based flap, which we used to do initially, but now there are a lot yes. of modifications and now we have changed our technique after uh, the articles from Dr. Penko and all. Yes. So this is the limbal based, but now I think we're going to discuss the pondix based, flap, which is now most of us are doing. This is also based useful flap. in certain situations. This is, is still valid yes, yes, yes. and useful uh, in certain situations. So what are the indications of limbal based flap in your... Uh, uh, I think we we'll just run a little bit of it. Yes, yes. So now coming to the first step, the exposure of the operating side. So what kind of uh, traction suture you would apply, whether it will be uh, corneal traction? You can just stop. Uh, Dr. Arora here. Yes, yes, yes. Talking about the uh, traction suture, whether it is the corneal traction suture or superior rectus traction suture or no suture, just the self-retaining speculum or uh, some people use that rotational grip wherein you just uh, grab the posterior tenus and sclera and just rotate uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the eye inferiorly. So I would like to know uh, what kind of traction suture are you using? Uh, no. I prefer this traction corneal suture. Okay, so uh, uh, Reena, what kind of suture? I used to traction? use superior rectus bridle, but over the years I've given up on superior rectus bridle suture. I either use a corneal stay suture or I use the speculums. I forget the name, which is the larger uh, arm inferiorly. Inferior so, one, yeah. Inferior yeah. pulcus. In a way that your superior. Yeah. The long speculum. So I've, moved to, yeah. I've moved to that speculum mostly, but in some cases where the eye is very deep set or your uh, your speculum might not be able to really expose the superior conjunctiva, in that scenario, I might take a corneal stay suture. Okay. So mostly, no, who is using, uh, no one is using superior rectus suture? Sunita, so, used lots in past. Point to, remember, point to emphasize is that if you use a superior rectus suture, use a round body needle and not a cutting needle what normally yes. people use. So the needle has to be round body, otherwise the cutting needle tears the conjunctiva and there's leakage from the thing because we are making a, uh, now the bleb right behind, uh, going quite behind. So that can leak. So if somebody has to use superior rectus, then use a round body needle. So one can use superior rectus also, but it can tear. There is a, uh, there are chances it can tear conjunctiva or can there can be hematoma also. Actually, uh, we have been using... So Superior rectus so, suture for so many yeah. details. Only now recently we have actually switched over. So the points so for those who use superior rectus still is to use an eyeless needle. Don't use the needles which have the eye and thread it. So that sort of causes traction on the rectus. And also, of course, to take the round body needle and not to damage the superior rectus. And uh, make sure that many, many patients actually you will find if you have a good speculum. You probably don't even need anything. They simply actually operate without the need for any kind of uh, either attraction yeah. suture or even a suture like this. My but I think for the beginner who are learning trabeculectomy, I think some kind of traction suture is better. Either uh, superior rectus or corneal. But corneal, I would say, has a learning curve. You have to really go to 90% of the depth. Uh, okay, so there are chances of perforation or if you are too superficial, cheese wiring. So it has definitely a learning curve. But it has its problems as I think uh, if you if you're trying to place the trap, no, you would require a traction suture. If you're just asking the patient look down and do it, it's fine. But if you want to place it super nasally, super temporally, you will require a little bit of traction. In block patient, then we always use a corneal traction suture. Yeah. Yeah. We also use corneal traction. So a what little is longest the cord length? Yeah. Little longest cord side. length. If you are saying superior, Dr. Ganesh, you are saying superior nasal, superior temporal. What is the preferred site? Like where should you perform uh, First, uh, My preference is, uh, I would usually go for the supranasal nasal first. Although many people say that, you know, it causes dysesthesia and that's what you see in the yes. literature also. But in my hand somehow, and uh, it's not been a big problem. So I would try to place it supranasally nasally first. Then I have 
more options so I can place the next one superiorly and go for a tube supratemporally. So I have my options open uh, as much as I would like to. Uh, so that's my other, take on that. Okay, any other opinions about the site? Uh, I think it's what I do is it's not really so much supranasal like in between the nasal supral quadrant, but it's superior but towards the nasal side. So it's just a very subtle one clock hour nasal is what I like to do so that and nowadays you're not really exploring large conjunctival flaps and all you're making very small conjunctival flaps. So you're leaving the rest of the conjunctiva undisturbed for a future trabeculectomy if required or a tube on the temporal. So, so um, okay. Mine is always Literature now. Yeah. I, I always do it exactly at 12 o'clock because I can do a, something uh, later uh, super nasally or super temporally. Uh, invariably, they end up with a cataract some, some a cataract surgery later. So the temporal cataract surgery is always left uh, alone. So the superior actually works best for me. So, I yeah, think I think I agree with you, uh, Dr. Arika, that uh, superior, as mentioned now in literature, is the best. It is most comfortable and the chances of infection are also uh, less, 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 <laughs> But I think still people are, and then if you have to perform another like tube implant, then you can go temporally or so nasally, superior nasally. See, you have five, five clock hours, this thing, four to five clock hours. Okay, so now I think, can we move, uh, Dr. Arun? Yeah, just one thing more. Uh, yeah. Some people are living a, a sort of uh, conjectiva that's a sort of a skirt on the coronal side. And that makes stitching a little more easily. They don't have to tie with the cornea. And they can stitch the conjunctiva. They get the good exposure also. What about uh, leaving a little flower, a skirt of conjunctiva there? Yeah, that frill of conjunctiva. I don't do that. Uh, I cut it flush. It's still choice, I think. I don't think there is anything yes. so much about it. Okay. And I, think, I don't think it's been documented so well also whether it gives any benefit or does not give any benefit. So, oh, Kriti Singh does it. She promotes it actually. So, I think it's not a very popular... Uh, it's not suturing, uh, conjunctival suturing technique, and uh, but yeah, but it's been mentioned, and some people are doing. Yeah, Doctor Keith is saying is doing that. So she calls this thing something. Conjunct. I know what. Yeah. So otherwise, uh, yeah. So uh, what suture would you use for the corneal traction suture? I use eight o vicryl. I use eight o vicryl. I can reuse it for suturing the exactly. uh, conjunctiva. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you can use 6O Vicryl or 6O Silk also. Yeah, Silk is okay. always Vicryl, good. They say that yeah. there are, are chances of you know cheese wiring because it is not a very thick suture. So, But uh, you can use it and then you can use it for conjunctiva suturing. Yeah, so so here uh, we are giving a relaxing incision, but now, uh, you know, sometimes I don't give it. And then you Actually, have to relaxing is to be given in TNN, not in conjunctiva. Relaxing incision in TNN is always good. Yeah, TNN it is gives good. you bigger exposure. Yeah. Uh, in conjunctiva, relaxing that makes the closure of the conjunctiva a little not so good looking yes. or uh, not so painless. So now coming to uh, this uh, mitomycin C. So I think let us talk about the antifibrotic agents, what kind of antifibrotic you use, MMC, sponges, or uh, injection. I think uh, anyone? Both I actually. Single, single point to mg per ml uh, mitomycin sponge. I just cut the tip of the sponge into a small piece, so one single bit. This multiple bits actually worries me a bit because sometimes there's a small fear that you may leave behind Somebody has to count the number of bits you keep. Maybe one or two bits are okay, but putting multiple bits all over, there's a small chance that you may leave things behind. So I use a single, maybe sometimes two bits, soak in uh, mitomycin, and I, I usually use a 0.2 mg per ml uh, concentration and uh, leave it for about between one to a maximum of three minutes, depending on the type of surgery, whether it's a resurgery or a secondary glaucoma or a young patient, mm -hmm. and depending on the risk of. Uh, uh, so-called uh, fibrosis and failure depending on the duration you can vary between one to three minutes and make sure the, uh, the mitomycin sponge is pushed behind pushed well away from the edge of the cut conjunctiva and uh, keep it covered for some time and then uh, maybe after you remove the mitomycin carefully discard it carefully 
and uh, give it a thorough wash with one or even two full syringes of uh, BSS. Flush it out well and make sure the mitomycin is discarded safely. So it's a toxic drug and the, the drug toxicity has to be kept in mind. It should not be casually thrown away somewhere. I think this is very important here. Yeah? And it's going to make sure where the blab is going to form. Yes. So, uh, how we are going to undermine uh, the conjectiva, which area we are especially looking for, we are going up or we are going the sideways, what is your strategy on for that? For making a good blab that should be a little away from the... There should be a definitely a good dissection, but not a very harsh dissection. It should be a gentle dissection. And I usually dissect both conjunctiva and tenens together. I don't do separate dissection. And make sure you expo have bias clearer when you are planning to place the uh, mitomycin. There are so many methods of placing the mitomycin. Some people do the mitomycin before the flap is made. I have now switched to keep placing the mitomycin after the flap is made, the triangle uh, flap. So people say that the hypotony chances are more when it's placed after the flap is made, but it has not been so in my experience. I usually place it after the flap is made and generally try to go a little more posterior and at the same time on either side of the flap rather than coming close to the limbus. The mito should be placed as far posterior as it is possible. And it should be evenly distributed, which is why maybe in certain patients, I also do the injectable mitomycin. The injectable mitomycin okay, also... So, uh, Dr. Uh, Murli, you said that you use only one uh, sponge. Yes. Most okay. often, I use only one. Uh, so, but the more field safe technique, they advise that you use multiple sponges and yeah. deep the formices because wherever you put the sponge, the uh, the, the blab is going to form there. And if you just use one, then uh, there are chances that it will be there more, more anteriorly. Uh, large the chances of thin cystic blab are there. So, uh, any large. other? Yeah. I use with the three to five sponges, but they are yeah. counted and they go really yeah. right for right posterior, cover nicely with the conjunctiva, and while washing also. The water should not be sent with too much of force because when you send with too much of force, sometimes the mitomycin actually gets underneath the tenon. It becomes swollen, swollen with that and also those little air bubbles come up. So one has yes. to be very gentle that whatever you're washing, very gentle wash. And in the end, uh, take two bu Johnson buds or the uh, this thing, the sponges and push pull out all the water which collects behind because it was the phonics. There's a lot of collection of water sometimes. Uh, depending upon the, uh, the kind of eye you have. If you have the eye which is slightly deeper set, it tends to go behind. So all that has to be brought out, whatever has been used, because mitomycin is a toxic drug. I think two important points. I think we all agreed that fornix-based conjunctival flap is what we prefer nowadays than the limbal-based, but you can do it. It is difficult, the access. But mitomycin C... Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Mitomycin C, I think, is what we are mostly using in terms of anti-metabolite and the dosage, I think Mr. Dr. Murali already mentioned yeah, 2 milligram to 4 milligram, 1 to 3 minutes, but a broader application. But please make sure the conjunctival edge is protected. You're not resting the edge onto the flaps. Sorry. You're not uh, resting it at the conjunctival edge. And I, I like to place at least three to four, depending upon how large you, your conjunctival edge is small. I don't like to do the side cuts, but when you're putting the flaps, you try and cover a larger area so that your bleb is more diffused and more posterior. I think yes. uh, that is what. Um, so I think that is very important, and I think as Dr. Madhu mentioned, counting is very very important. Whether you are putting three or four, I think it has to be counted. Otherwise, there's a possibility of leaving it behind. And, uh, also, with seeing the sponges, because sometimes the sponges are brittle. So one yes. must ensure a very good quality of sponge, which is not brittle because the brittle ones, a small piece breaks down inside and that piece can be, if it stays behind, it will lead to necrosis of the conjunctiva and the bleach. Bleep. So uh, there are polyvinyl, nice. polyvinyl yes. sponges, I think, which yes. are then metal cellulose uh, sponges. So I think that should be used. You're absolutely right. And broader application. So anyone, Dr. Rina, you have been using Ologen. Uh, so... Uh, what? I use Ologen, uh, but I never use Ologen in combination with an anti-metabolite. And I choose my Ologen in some situations like high myopes so or people where I'm worried about mitomycin C related complications in the post-operative period, long-term complications, especially in young patients, young myopes. Sometimes yes. I like to use Ologen. 
and the whole idea is to do wound modulation using it and once we come to how to make this clear flap how to suture my technique of suturing and all becomes a little different because in ologen i want my trabeculectomy filters to filter a little more than usually what my end point is with anti metabolites on the table and ologen does really well if you um, you know make sure that you're taking these specific uh, care during uh, the surgery so ologen i use it's it's placed under the conjunctiva after completing your scleral flap as a substitute for an anti metabolite i never combine it Yeah, so uh, Dr. Murli or Dr. Gadi. Also releasable. Uh, use... Rina, you put releasables also every time, yes. you know, because you can't do sterilizers. Yes. So yes. do you use uh, uh, Ologen or even Avastin? Yes, madam. Uh, 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 no, we don't. I don't use Avastin with Ologen. We use Ologen. My three indications are number one is when I'm operating on a patient with traumatic cataract, a uh, young patient, as Dr. Traumatic Rina mentioned. Glaucoma. You know, you don't want hypotonic. Traumatic glaucoma, yeah. yeah. Traumatic glaucoma, sorry, not cataract. Uh, mm -hmm. Traumatic uh, glaucoma, and you don't want hypotonia to set in because you never know when the end of thalmodonosis will precipitate a retinal detachment and all the other complications if the hypotonia occurs because of mitomycin C. The second yeah. is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis in which you cannot use uh, mitomycin C. The third patient is a high myope, young high myope in which uh, you don't again want to have hypotonia. And when I use uh, Ologen, I use all the releasable sutures. Uh, the last releasable suture is usually very difficult to pluck out, uh, so it fu functions as a fixed suture. But the first, second uh, suture you can easily uh, remove, and you can titrate your pressures uh, very nicely. And uh, I use a triangular flap, so the first uh, releasable to go is the apical one. Then I start removing the side sutures. So I do it about uh, five days, or depending on how far the patient is coming from, how easy he is able to access uh, our services. So that's how we uh, use ologen in our center. We don't mix it with the mitomycin C. Drawbacks to ologen. There are some drawbacks to ologen. The primary drawback seems to be nowadays one is availability, second is the cost. The cost has shot up now. I think each each bit of ologen of about a six into two mm, the round circular one costs about nearly seven thousand, eight thousand now. So adding eight thousand to the cost of the surgery is uh, not possible for every patient who is undergoing glaucoma surgery in our uh, kind of setup. So actually, we have we have compared our own data of uh, ologen drives with mitomycin drives to the one to two minute to the point two, and did find that there is no difference, if not uh, better, with better results with the mitomycin drive. So we yeah, have, so yeah, I agree with Doctor You or uh, Doctor Murli. In yeah. even very high myope, if you just just use for a very short time, very so low concentration of MMC and. Put lot of releasable sutures and try to prevent hypotony. It can work because ologen is expensive. But yeah, yeah, there are certain indications which you can use. The yeah, other thing to remember is that in the post-operative period, ologen blebs morphology is very different from the MMC blebs. So even in the early post-operative period, manipulating and uh, just on the basis of intraocular pressure. But we have to remember these blebs look different. These blebs don't look like those raised. MMC blebs. There are these shallow blebs where you can see the disc over a period of time that uh, starts to get absorbed and disappear. But what you are left behind is a shallow bleb, but it's functional. So uh, the take-home message is that you can use in certain conditions if the patient can afford it, uh, but not in every patient because it may not give you any advantage. Just one more point uh, about the your pressure audience. lowering is lower than mitomycin C. And even chances of encysted blebs are more with ologen as compared to the. Just one uh, more point about the ologen is that when you are placing the ologen, it must be little beyond the apex of the flap. The yeah. second thing is the flap should not be sutured very tightly. Exactly. If you really suture the uh, flap very tightly, it, it will not percolate through the ologen. So you do need aqueous percolation, aqueous perfusion through the ologen for it to work. So you do need to keep it behind a little bit and make sure the flap is not tightly sutured. And the ologen should not rest on top of the flap. If you place it on the flap and suture it up and cover the conjunctiva, the blood will not elevate at all. You simply find. If, if I may just add one more point to uh, that, Dr. Murli, you shouldn't suture the conjunctiva to the ologen also, Absolutely. because it causes an idus for infection. So make sure this the suturing of the conjunctiva is separate, separately done from the ologen area. Ologen should be left left alone. Yes. In pediatric cases, okay, is it safe? And. I, 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 although there are a lot of disadvantage with ologen for a private practitioner who has, uh, for example, does does so much of uh, uh, traps. I think mixing a mitomycin, keeping it ready, 
and if the staff is not well versed collagen is more helpful for him compared to uh, mitomycin c i think the only uh, indication where i might still keep collagen as a good option is high myops young high myops everywhere as ah. mitomycin c probably yeah. is your first choice good collagen vascular is also like rheumatoid and bad collagen vasculars though they also melt very easily they melt True. So, is it safe in pediatric cases? Secondly, not should we apply? Evidence. There's not enough pediatric, evidence. Pediatric, nobody's. So we don't use it at all. We don't have enough experience with the right with ologen, hmm. and I think that is why we are not very comfortable using it. But it acts as a spacer also, and I think it prevents uh, uh, the uh, scarring at the episcleral level because uh, you know it acts as a reservoir and keep absorbing the aqueous. So it maintains that space, and that is why. I think they, it, it, uh, the 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 I think why we are not able to use it is we are not able to manipulate the pediatric eyes so as easily as we can do the adult eyes, you know. So that's why we we everything we have to do under general anesthesia or under sedation, uh, we are not able to evaluate so well as adult eye. That's why the experience is a little less. You cannot apply releasable sutures in pediatric eyes no, for them to be removed. You don't know what may happen next. For the audiences, you can use Olorgen. If you are expecting a high complications because of mitomycin C, like in young high myopes with thin sclera and all, any experience with use of avastin or any special situations where you would like to use? No. Yes, yes, uh, Sunita, I have used in the yeah. people because ologen ologen has to be bought separately. But avastin with retina people have and it's always <laughs> surplus. <laughs> For instance, these kind of patients who are high myopes. <laughs> I use intra bleb, and sometimes after three four days, when the bleb starts getting more vascular, to take the vascular factor in the in the bleb, you can give a subconjunctival after the surgery th three to four days later. It works, especially uh, meant for these people only who are contraindication for mitomycin C or new vascular glaucomas. In them, of course, we always give. A but again, I think it's health. expensive. It is expensive, expensive, but you know, yes, compared to MMC. because they make 20, 27, 30 <laughs> doses in one vial. So one vial is not used completely. So it, they, it's always available for free. As well. <laughs> that's that's it. Okay, <laughs> okay so, so now I think. So to uh, all the way. panelists, just, just to all the panelists, where would you look prefer to put MMC uh, in the, uh, say under the conjunctiva or after making scleroflap? What's your choice to all of you? I use under the conjunctiva. My choice is under the conjunctiva. Yeah. Under the conjunctiva. I do it after the flap. Use it under the flap. After the flap. <laughs> right. So we got two choices here. Uh, we move to the next part. So now uh, I think this has been done. Yes. So into the uh, scleral flap, I think, which is, we know that it's a flow resistor and you need to have a very robust scleral flap. Okay, so and the size, shape, and thickness all matter to some extent. Yes. I'd like to now know what kind of scleral flap do you uh, perform, make, and what thickness and uh, what are the factors you'll keep in mind while you know making the scleral flap. So scleral flap, I'll go first. Uh, scleral flap, I usually do triangle of scleral flap, and I mark it using the 15 number barden Parker knife. The 15 number barden yes. Parker knife as a one millimeter bevel okay so once you the groove once you keep the square flap in the uh, make the groove and you slant the knife slightly you can see that it is tinged with blood half of it is tinged with blood so you know you are in the correct depth so you get a 50 percent uh, flap thickness straight away so you don't require expensive equipment it's very simple and uh, we don't use a crescent because crescent comes in an angulated form so use a part barden parker 15 number number 15 blade and you can uh, we've been doing this and we've been teaching it and uh, i think it's a very uh, simple trick to achieve the correct depth we lift the flap with the 15 number blade itself so the view is pretty good and you don't have a another like the crescent which is obstructing the view what is the size of base of triangle at the cornea level so okay. the cornea will be uh, if it's a trap it's 5 by 5 if it's a fake or trap, it will be four by four. Four to five, depending upon what one needs. And actually, see, uh, crescent, there's nothing wrong in crescent. I use, bo I use both of them. I use both of them, actually. So it doesn't really make a difference, actually, Ganesh. If you use a crescent, it goes into cornea very nicely. And, you know, you don't have to go by the sides. So you're saving those sides so the leak is saved. 
so this is another thing you know make a, make it little rounded yeah don't go till the limit i agree but again millimeter before again the, that and make a very nice rounded thing and believe me i use all the fecco instruments then with 2.2 2.2 you make a small entry and take a punch so all the cadric instruments can be used but yes for the depth uh, this uh, bp knife is the best thing to judge the depth i think there's only one point and also the yeah uh, uh, 15 blade is the best to add Yeah. One time, if you are making the uh, clap with the fifteen blade, and if you're not as experienced as Ganesh is, you may tend to get jagged, uh, uneven cuts in the under surface of the clap. So it makes sense for at least maybe a beginner or some little relatively inexperienced glaucoma surgeon to probably use the crescent so that you can at least get a smoother under surface of the clap and a half thickness clap and triangle between four to five millimeter diameter. For, so four to five millimeter is the preferred. You must at least have one millimeter or two millimeters of conjunctiva on either side of the flap, on either side of the base of the flap. So you don't, uh, you, you should have uh, definitely have at least one or two millimeters on either side. And I think so. The the point of using a crescent as well as knife, the expense is an issue. You know, uh, since we are talking about mitomycin C and Olegen, expense is again an issue. So you can, if you don't have SICS set, if you want to do a trap, you can still go ahead and do it. And also, also yes, triangular yes, yes, everybody has. It's well. a very, very cheap one. <laughs> yeah, I think Ganesh, just... you are working in a hospital which gets grants of million, million euros and million pounds. <laughs> I think you should not talk about it. <laughs> no, no, no. We have to because yeah. you know the the far flung areas. You don't have getting access to equipment like this is a little difficult. Uh, it's it's uh, you have to. Uh, I think I would just go back and. Tell you the European Glaucoma Society guidelines. You know the recent one. They say cost containment is a component of glaucoma care. So whatever you use, I think you should be very, very uh, conscious about it. And uh, I would always say that you know, uh, make it as simple as possible so that you can train the next generation. Both work well, actually. Uh, Rora, can you just uh... the equally smooth whether you use 15 number blade or crescent, both work well. It's just a matter of how straight you are as a surgeon, like. So It's actually, I use crescent because I uh, dissect into the clear cornea and leave yeah. millimeter of sclera undissected on the sides. That so, I think the key. What uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Sunita are mentioning, we don't want the scleral flap to go up to the cornea. The the anterior in the center. Cornea. In the center, it goes up to the cornea. On the periphery, you just leave it. Can you just uh, proceed with the surgery, doctor? Yeah. And one millimeter rim always does good on the side. Yeah, like, so you have to yeah. that, leave it undissected. And how much thickness do you prefer, fifty percent or? Uh, Usually fifty percent, but it could be lesser also if you want more pressure drop. Then it's one third. Yeah, it's one third to half generally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the thinner the scleral flap, the more. So more in the, the center, filtering. I think you have to dissect the up to clear cornea because uh, yes. you want. Uh, Basically, it is not trabeculectomy. You are dissecting a little bit of, you know, you are removing a part of cornea also, keratectomy also. Yeah, this is comes with crescent. It doesn't come with fifteen number blade. Yeah, so that is why, and the side, yeah. And side port, you should not have the top. It is said that uh, the the base should be wider at the limbus because so as to have more resistance and the aqueous will not flow the sideways. Hmm. Okay, because so this is a eleven number five, knife. Five by four, rather than having a square one, so that you have more, you know, uh, weight on this on 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 the side. Side. Yes. Will find some resistance to flow on the sides, and it will flow posteriorly. And uh, you could also use that Kelly's desperate sponge for this. Yes, yes, uh, yes. There was another video wherein so you can uh, use both the techniques. Yes. I'll just come up to that. Two point two keratom. Two point two keratom. Tip. The learners, the paracentesis importance before yeah. entering. Yeah. Yes. Important. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll show that one also. And uh, you're placing pre-placed sutures on uh, before making the entry on the flap or something. Sutures. Huh? Yeah. If it's high opening uh, pressure, I don't do that. Be there. Otherwise, you don't have uh, to. High opening pressure, high pressure you have to do it. Because once you open it, you it becomes a little, little trickier to uh, put sutures. It becomes much easier if you place it before uh, making opening here. But sutures also yeah. run all over, no? So if it's a high high opening pressure, then we obviously take. Okay. 
Yeah, so basically, uh, you want to prevent hypotony duration. Yeah. As yeah. Aurora is saying, if you have a pre pre sutures, immediately you can tie. Actually, I think, especially for beginners, if you are a very experienced surgeon, then it is okay. You can put sutures even in hypotenuse eye. But if you are not so experienced, then I think it is better to put pre sutures. We always yeah, at least one pre is fine. Because it just maintains the chamber well and you're in control always. Yes, yes. Hold it quickly. So so even in does anyone use viscoelastic? Very rare. Not I do not use methyl yeah. cellulose, but I might use sodium hyaluronate if I'm worried for chances of intraoperatively shallow AC and all, then I might put very little sodium hyaluronate in very rare high-risk cases, not routinely at all. I use Helon, not in all patients, but in some patients. And these patients are usually when the IOP is not getting controlled, you're doing uh, 30 plus IOP. Sometimes you have to do it. Second is these NVG patients. I always use Helon to start with to fill the chamber because in case it bleeds, uh, the the blood keeps on going out and doesn't fill the chamber. And after the uh, trabeculectomy is over and there is no bleeding, then of course remove the helon from the anterior, uh, anterior chamber. Yeah. I do the same. I use helon if in high risk eyes. Yeah. Yeah. And also if in tragic eyes, not long always. standing bufthalmos also, long standing bufthalmos patients, I use helon and uh, reduce the pressure very slowly. Actually replace the equus with helon slowly because those eyes also tend to run, run out like tap. Yeah. Those four or five year old babies. Most of hypotony is very, very right. common in such long standing bupthal yeah. because of stretched sclera and thin sclera. But, so, only but not otherwise, Hiron. in routine cases, we, we do, don't um, uh, any viscoelastic because it becomes very difficult to titrate because that's yeah. one of the important steps. The point, uh, the point is that uh, we use the uh, viscoelastic like sodium hyaluronate better than uh, much. Uh, preferred as as compared to methyl cellulose. Methyl cellulose, it yeah. Usually gives me yeah. a leave behind the fibrin reaction sometimes and I think it's generally not preferred. I think we all use sodium hyaluronate as occasion occasional patient, but not as a regular uh, feature. But I think none of us would probably use leave behind methyl cellulose. No, no. Don't leave no leaving behind. And it's very difficult to clear methyl cellulose. In an eye, we are doing so methyl cellulose definitely it's not very... preferred. I mean, uh, preferred to use sodium hyaluronate, yeah, definitely. Then we all have the Indian brands of hyaluronate also, uh, Ganesh. We don't use Elon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically, it comes as a bolus. It comes as a bolus. So it makes the. Even uh, for the AC deformation, also we use uh, you know, Elon. Sodium hyaluronate. Elon, yeah. Not Elon. Or, or 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 what? <laughs> okay. So I think. Uh, I'll show the yeah, second. So you part. can do uh, scler this sclerostomy with Vana scissors as well as with Kelly sponge. And then what about iridectomy? Because in West, uh, they sometimes in POAG they do not do iridectomy. But what is the importance of doing iridectomy? And in which we have, cases do we you have mostly get? PACGs, and we yeah. always do we always do PI, and PI is at least as big as the inner ostium. The base of the PI as big as the inner ostium. Iridectomy is a must. I think you must do the iridectomy. It must be broad and basal. It must be definitely as large or at least if not larger than the ostium. So it doesn't plug the ostium and uh, prevents the pupillary block and so on. Definitely an iridectomy is a must and allow the iris to prolapse inside and cut it parallel to the limbus so that you avoid uh, cutting the iris jagged. There's a simple technique of cutting the iris. Maybe the video could show that. Okay, we are just showing I the think iridectomy is very important, uh, mainly because supposing your chamber were to shallow, the iris will go and plug the ostium. You know, and if you have seen any eyes which have a shallowing chamber and you see them post-operatively about, let's say, one year, two years later, you'll find that the limbs of the iris have stuck to the ostium, but the uh, filter still works. So the ostium is patent, IOP uh, is still low, but you know that post uh, long time back, there was a shallowing of the chamber and the limbs of the iris have gone stuck to the freshly cut structure. So iridectomy is very important, even though it may you may have a complication in the immediate post-operative period, later on the filter can continue to function. So it's a mandatory for most of the cases. So we move on to the next, that's Kelly sponge. A quick run video. So what size of the punch are we using, sir? 
डॉक्टर सुनीता जीरो पॉइंट सेवन फाइव एंड देन यू मेक थ्री फोर मंथ डेमोस्ट्रेटेड हि so as far as possible it should be in the center as we are saying that if it is eccentrically placed then there will be very less uh, you know resistance to flow on that side so um, the, uh, the yeah. you know sideway flows of uh, sideways flow will be there so i think as far as possible so you could you could make yeah three three marks on 1 uh, mm within uh, you have yeah. two marks and right in the center you have one mark so you know yes. you are exactly in the Uh, Dr. Anil Mittal surgery demonstrate that's very well. That where you have to make the. Uh, I think costume. another very important point here is to hold the flap very gently and avoid a non-tooth forceps. Sometimes they see beginners holding the flap with a tooth forceps or even the micro tooth kind of forceps. Best is to avoid a tooth forceps to hold the flap. Otherwise, you'll be making small buttonhole kind of holes in the little flap itself. To so use non-tooth forceps. I think you could. I think you could. Yeah, you could use a serrated forceps. I mean a. Uh, a uh, tying force up non tooth will not hold very well but you can use a serrated force up to hold the uh, pierce flap like. i think pierce hoskins forceps is the best which we use pierce is the best and pierce hoskins is the big but is perfect to see the placement of the vanas and the uh, direction of uh, exact perpendicular uh, cut to the uh, limbus i think this is the way the iris should be cut I think the other important message for the beginners is how to make the entry. As Dr. Sunita was mentioning, that you are not just removing trabecular meshwork. The surgical anatomy of the limbus is important here. And when you are entering the AC, it's actually the cornea. The I mean, you you are entering in the cord, clear cornea, and it's a bit of keratectomy along with the trabeculectomy. So if you are very posterior, you will end up falling onto the ciliary body area and causing causing bleeding and failure of your. trap so it's very important the location of where you went there and how you create the ostium you're basically taking a lid of peripheral little bit of peripheral cornea and the trabecular meshwork you don't want to be very posterior if you went up prematurely then you'll end up uh, making the ostium on the scleral uh, ciliary body area so, so it should be anterior to the scleral spur yeah exactly between clj and slj sclerolimbal junction and corneolimbal junction it should be in between that and this area is exactly 1 mm broad So when we take a punch, point seven five, and we take two punches, we are cutting exactly that punch of area. Going posterior also can make a cycle dialysis cleft. Exactly. I've seen somebody's one patient, a cleft. The patient would just not respond to anything till UBM showed that uh, cleft right, right at the posterior lip of the trabeculate like being um, uh, in a ostium. So what is the preferred size of this ostium opening? Uh, it's one and a half by one, like that. Point five millimeter. Yes. Uh, provided you give some space between the edge of the ostium and the edge of the flap, right? One millimeter space, yeah. yeah One millimeter. So I think it depends on the size of the uh, scleral flap. Yes. But if yeah. you have made a very large scleral flap, then you have to make a large sclerostomy. But as Major. I rightly yeah. said, you it has to be covered on either side by the scleral flap by at least one millimeter. Titration, like okay. chemistry titration, they have to be titrated yeah. with the size of each other. So I think the I think the previous video will show you that one. So now coming to the scleral flap suturing, I think that is most important uh, aspect again. What kind of sutures and releasable sutures, and uh, you know whether you prefer to uh, use releasable sutures. At least one releasable for sure in for every patient. Otherwise, two releasables. Yeah, so in this video also, I have used one uh, fixed as well as one releasable suture, the uh, Kolker's technique, in a the reverse direction, starting from cornea, and then going on to this. So you can uh, have you know multiple techniques of um, uh, putting up releasable sutures, and uh, I think all of us agree that uh, we uh, need releasable sutures in our in traps, and we do. Thank mm -hmm. you.
they you cause know, no harm just, uh, and you have safety if you have used anti metabolites these releasables work very well up to 4 to 5 weeks so now yeah so titration i think how do you titrate your wound that's a very good question yeah, so i, I think this, yeah. yeah you just showed it yeah you just showed it it's very important that you don't want an absolutely dry a uh, wound like after you put the sutures you want to put a little bit of uh, saline from the side port and see how much filtration there is use a dry vexel sponge to assess that you want just an ooze you don't want an absolutely watertight wound and you don't want a leaky wound so what i like is i like to see a ooze and if it's not an ooze i adjust my sutures i either tighten my releasable or Uh, uh, loosen it a little bit to make sure that I get an end point where I have a nose and the eye is neither too soft nor too hard. But I don't want a dry wound or a very very over filtering uh, wound. Okay. So, any other opinions on this? Oh, she said very rightly. It should be sweating from the uh, edges. Basically, it looks like a sweat. Very fine, thin film comes slowly, gently. that's what we look we looked at and that should come if that doesn't come now at the time of, at the time on the table it doesn't come afterwards also so on the very first morning your release of releasing releasables is not a great situation to be in so it should be a little bit of a uh, leaky wound but not really and acid on its own should remain very nicely formed these two things have to go simultaneously many a times the ac on the table just is not forming and we really think we put three sutures is all right especially in people who are very young uh, where skull rigidity is very high so ac to well formed and slight ooze from the wound is desirable for that you may require any number of sutures number of sutures is not a criteria yeah you may get in one suture also sometimes in a triangular no, no. and uh, you it? can uh, take multiple sutures also till yeah, your you can i huh. is you know i should not be hypotenuse no. in relatively or you know at the end of the surgery you should aim for at least i think uh, 12 to 14 mm pressure it's should... better to have firm than soft you know because firm can be managed later by releasable release but uh, soft ties are difficult to manage afterwards yes. so it is better to have slightly higher pressure yeah. which you can then uh, reduce by the releasable sutures or laser sutureolysis so now uh, since we are talking about uh, releasable suture how early can you remove them and what are the criteria for removing releasable sutures i think it would depend on whether you use mitomycin or not suppose you have used mitomycin and if you have uh, usually the, the releasable works best if the the suture is at the apex the yeah, uh, most of us i think prefer to use we're using a triangle flap the apex one would have the releasable but that has the maximum effect when it, when it is released so suppose you use mitomycin in whatever dosage and duration it works best maybe between say uh, one week to maybe up to a month or even a little longer if you have not used mitomycin the releasable is probably best released at about, at about two weeks between two weeks to maybe a month or so is the window period for releasable at least in my hands if i use mitomycin maybe i can wait a little longer also if my pressure doesn't come say between 12 to 18 or 12 to 16 in two weeks then i would definitely consider releasing releasing the uh, apex uh, releasable suture and of course uh, do it with caution and uh, make sure you take all the precaution that you don't get a sudden uh, leak or sudden shallowing of the chamber and so on so, so don't do it too early at the same time don't wait too late also I like the two week uh, period. Usually, I if I have to release the releasables, I choose a period of after two weeks. And before that, if my blebs are not filtering, the pressures are very high. Sometimes also give just a little massage to see, yes. you know, if there's anything occluding and it goes away. And then usually the blebs form and they maintain decent pressure. But if they don't, and if I have two or something, then I might have the courage to if the really pressures are twenty eight, thirty or something. that's the only situation where i might otherwise after two weeks depending upon what the pressures are how is the height of the bleb and the filtration you can see and how much vascularization is going on so rena do you release the suture on the basis of pressure or the configuration of bleb so to... yes sometimes my thing is that my pressures are let's say 14 but i can mm-hmm. see the bleb is shallowing and it's getting vascularized i might err towards or my threshold to remove the releasable is going to be much lower so uh, okay has anyone removed releasable suture on the very first or second day post operatively i have i have i have, yes. I have removed <laughs> the pressure comes 28 30 you can't afford it 
right so was on first day also you may have to remove it actually if there is no mitomycin see if you don't remove within one week yeah, it's it no can't. good removing it afterwards but if you're using mitomycin see i've used a window of up to three months and after three months also it works so mitomycin gives a lot of leverage to use releasables also or do suturolysis like sometimes two releasables gone is still you're having a problem then a laser suturolysis done to the last suture also it works yeah, so I absolutely. Yeah, uh, also, uh, yeah. I have also removed sutures on the very next day. It depends if you have put a very tight suture and with digital massage also bleb, bleb is not getting. Then obviously your sterile flap is very very tight and there is no harm in you know removing one suture but one at a time. And I have also. So I would usually if I have a. Yeah. If I have eye. Yeah, sure, for example, like a monocular eye. Uh, and you would hesitate to intervene or that's the so-called better eye, so, so to say. And I would usually start them on uh, oral Diamox for about three to four days and then call them back again and reassess. And whenever I release the suture, uh, let's say 15 days later, I never do uh, two interventions at the same time. I would just release the suture but not give massage. Mm -hmm. So that's something which we important yeah. which we have to know. Don't be too aggressive in your pressure lowering tactics. So once you have released the suture, the next sitting will be about three to five days later when he comes either you give massage or you cut the next uh, uh, suture or do a next releasable suture release. Also choosing which suture to deal with. Sometimes that also helps depending upon the morphology and you know how you've used triangular, rectangular flap, how many releasables or non-releasable. Sometimes you have to plan that you're going to release the apex suture as Dr. Murali was saying or you want to do a suture like this. So I, I, you play with it depending upon where you want to open up the flow. So I usually also tend to use a central. So you decide, Rina, intraoperatively only. That so you depends. Uh, it you know, the flow is likely to be more from this side. Yeah. So if at all you have to remove, you should remove that. And then you document it in your... Absolutely. And also sometimes yeah. I'm stable if you know in one particular area, either due to cautery or whatever reason, you're getting more filtration and I've put an extra releasable. I'll always document it so that yes. I know, you know on the table how things are behaving. Do you do that? You could do that even later. Supposing you are having a cystic deformation in one direction, you want the flow to go the other direction. You start uh, addressing the sutures on that direction. You could uh, change the morphology as it is forming in the first initial three to four months. Do you do the digital massage yourself or train the patient how to do it? Early post-operative no, period. We do it ourselves, sir. Yeah, early post-operative period, you can't tell the patient to do it because uh, that will land you in trouble. It's yes. basically to assess how things are on the tape, on the slit lamp. You're looking at the slit lamp and you can give a digital massage. These I'm talking about first, first post-op days and all of your pressures are high then. Of right. course, the digital massage in the later post-operative period is another story. Right. Uh, what's your post-op regime? Do you go home atropine or steroids or whatever? What is the post-op regime you're using? So definitely steroids for at least two, two and a half months, sometimes even three months. Uh, I like funny. to use prednisolone acetate, but uh, I'm sure we can take the opinion of other panelists. I like to use a midriatic as well, at least for a week, especially in angle closure eyes, because they have a risk of aqueous misdirection as well. And you want to keep the lens iris diaphragm, you know, posteriorly. So I like to use midriatics, mostly home atropine in these patients. So as a routine, I give it to them for a week and in an angle closure eye, I might even give it longer, especially young patients, very shallow other eye and an angle closure disease where you have to do a trabeculectomy. I like to put them on midriatics for even longer. And steroids at least about um, two to three months, depending upon vascularization and other factors. In prednisolone, you continue for three months? Two to three months. Two, okay. definitely. Very <clears throat> rarely six weeks. And in some situations, I would even go up to three months if I feel that my uh, if there is no risk of steroid response, of course, that you have to keep in mind. Badu, uh, what's I, I, I start with prednisolone, but after two weeks, I get them down to DEXA or betamethasone because uh, only that much is required unless and until there is some problem. And uh, if the patient is angle closure and the ACs have been very shallow, I would use atropine instead of homatropine. Normal angle closures, very simple homatropine. And if open angle glaucoma, two weeks over, but if it's angle closure glaucoma, at least four weeks, because I've seen malignant glaucomas actually happening not often, but they do happen, and then it's a challenge for you. In so fact, in a patient I have to use for two years, she went into such a malignant thing, young girl, 
with microspherophakia that two years atropine had to be continued. So Dr. Mohit, what's your also, I like to start at six times and taper it quickly every week. But when I come down to two and one, then sometimes I linger it on for longer. But six, four, three, it's one, one week. And then once you reach twice a day, depending upon the blood morphology. I and even uses NSAIDs apart from steroids? I don't. I don't use actually. Truthfully, I don't yeah. use. Yeah. yeah, so I agree with Dr. Madhu. Like in primary angle closure glaucomas, we also use atropine for two to three weeks at least. Angle closure, you have to watch out. Yeah. Because risk of aqueous misdirection is definitely there in angle closure. Guys. Yeah, for conjunctival closure, what kind of sutures uh, uh, you people are using? Like aided or monofilament? And uh, for, uh, we are, the same suture as was the yeah. uh, polygractin. Uh, that's what we use. Actually, I use I the nylon for everything. I use it for the flap as well as for the conjunctive. I use only one suture. And uh, most often, I don't take any suture, either superior rectus or traction. So I use only one ten zero nylon. That is also from Autolab. So that is the lowest. <laughs> but but the other, other, other things are very expensive for you. <laughs> <laughs> you have jacked up the prices the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I think like or because I, in my hands, I felt that I induced some inflammation in the conjunctiva, and I like to use only ten or nylon for my scleral flap and for my conjunctiva because I, I like. To find uh, the inflammation is more with vicryl. Yes, I always exactly. prefer nylon to vicryl always, in. especially uh, yeah. The quiet eyes come only with the nylon. Yeah, you get a nice conjunctiva, white-looking conjunctiva. And less uh, those deep vessels and all coming onto it. So I like uh, tenno. But uh, like, you know, you are absolutely right. With uh, monofilament nylon, the inflammation is very less. But with vicryl, if you're using pearl string and tying the knot and draping the conjunctiva over the suture, and there's no exposure of the suture over the conjunctiva, then I think the inflammation is pretty less and patient is very comfortable. And it doesn't attract vascularization. And yeah, it, it, it absorbs very nicely. But many times we have to remove the nylon sutures. Oh, yeah. nylon, we have to remove we have the nylon sutures. Mostly we have to remove nylon. Often, yeah. nylon earlier, but nylon has to be removed. It has to be yeah. removed. There isn't another way about it. But yes, one point we did not it, talk about was scleral flap, flap has to be sutured always with non-absorbable. nylon. That yeah. has to be nylon cano. It cannot be any kind of vicryl. Because vicryl gives way in three weeks' time and you have put vitamin then you are gone. Dr. Madhu, so, unless you don't want to use releasable and give additional vicryl tenno sutures, which will, you know, open up. Yeah, inflammation, uh, uh, inflammation will matter. Dr. Murli is saying something. Yeah. Dr. Murli. Done a study using, instead of releasable sutures, she has actually done the scleral flap suturing with vicryl. And uh, instead of the releasable going off, uh, you're removing the releasable. The suture gets absorbed in about four to six weeks or something like that. So it definitely works like a releasable suture, and she has been used. She has used it quite a bit. I've seen many of her surgeries and her videos. She does use her vicryl suture for the scleral flap. I think none of us do it. Who, here. sir? Dr. Vijaya. Who, sir? Uh -huh. Vijaya uh -huh. does it. So she has shown many videos in many of our city meetings and all that about the uh, vicryl suture, where she does not want to use a releasable suture. So that's the, it's not that it cannot be done at all. It is being done, but of course, none of us here do it. We don't use vicryl. No, I, I, but I think uh, in, 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 in congenital glaucoma surgery, where we have to put a lot of sutures and you don't, can't remove releasable. So in that case, I think tenno vicryl on the scleral flap is very good. Not all tenno vicryl. I think there is a one suture which is nylon, one suture which is vicryl. Yeah. In many of uh, yeah, not many of the procedures. So Trebi is the probably only surgery where we works against the nature. We don't want healing. We want the thing to be patent. So it's against the way normally we do in other surgeries. And if the, your Trebi start uh, getting blocked or it's getting failed, what strategy do you take at that time? Do you do revise the blab or something, whatever your strategy that time. We look at the cause uh, first as to what is causing it actually. Is okay. it is it really something inside blocking it or it is outside? So if it's inside, then what all can be there in what phase? So if it's inside, it could be a blood clot, it could be fibrin, 
it could be an iris blocking so those we deal accordingly and if it's outside i think somebody else should answer because i should be the murli ganesh anybody any one of you outside yeah. there so many things to do actually <laughs> of course you are yeah. <laughs> what you're talking about is immediate post op maybe little intermediate period and maybe late post op the immediate period when the blep does not elevate at all then we know the ostium is blocked or visco is blocking it or iris is blocking it or something else is there we need to identify the cause but after some time it is worked and then starts scarring then we you know scarring is the issue so you probably have to deal with the scarring and uh, deal with the subcutaneous fibrosis there so many ways to deal with it like picking it up early the releasable sutures the massage and of course then the injectable uh, fire few to raise up the blep and cause the breaking of the uh, uh, sort of uh, the uh, anti fibrotic kind of measures epidural yeah. tissue yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, needling with fire few is a very popular procedure with many of us do and uh, the yeah, technique works best in certain certain patients you know it will work well in certain patients you know it may not work well but we still give it a try because it's a relatively simple inexpensive procedure if that does not work then you probably have to go back and revise the trap so you do needling so, with fire few uh, or mitomycin c i my needling uh, i would do it with mitomycin c even i can, you, can you tell us dr ganesh the technique uh, how do you do needling with mitomycin c so the important thing is to find out whether the ostium is patent or not that's something which you have to do gonioscopy for so if the ostium is patent that means uh you, what you see is the light going in but not coming out so it's something like a small psychodialysis cleft you see a gap between the flap and the uh, base of the flap so now you know that the episcular tissue is what you have to address if the flap is totally adherent that means you have to address the ostium also so for that what we use is a grover spatula it's a long spatula in which you insert it inferiorly with a chamber filled with viscoelastic insert it into the ante chamber and go towards the apex of the triangular flap which you created the spatula is curved in such a manner it just goes in and lifts the apex of the flap once you have done that you can replace the visco with uh, saline or bss and then you start the needling procedure but before you do that we give a uh, mitomycin c subcutaneous injection behind the bleb or the area where we are we see the demarcation of the flap uh, scleral uh, flap so you once are, you have you done do, the injection wait for 2 minutes internal. it's ab internal procedure we do ab internal as well as ab external if the flap is open uh, ostium is open then you don't have to do the ab internal no the procedure is ab external the procedure is ab external but you can lift the flap ab internal And okay so once you have the how much concentration of mitomycin c we inject 0.1 cc of a 0.2 mg per ml so mm-hmm. the delivery is 20 micrograms 0.2 002 0.2 yeah i think so no. that's the amount of and then you use a 26 gauge needle okay cut mm-hmm. the uh, subcutaneous plane and then you go beneath the flap so you do it from the right side as well as the left side of the flap so there are two openings and the openings preferably will be about 6 to 8 mm away from the uh from the demarcation of the flap and once you have entered you can even use a ac maintainer so the as the fluid comes out you can see that the uh, the blep continues to form and the areas which are still scarred or which have not separated as you would find when you are injecting a, a fluid beneath the conjunctiva as you are starting the surgery in the beginning you find that some areas are adherent you go to the other side and then you can do the then needling in that area also so suppose your first baby is of uh, the uh, needling in your hands ganesh so we did a thesis actually uh, we did a thesis uh, for one year we had a six months follow up period and uh, we had about 58 patients so the total success is about 88% uh, the qualified success is about uh, you could say about uh, 48 patients were uh, completely off medication 
another uh, 35 patients needed one or two medications so the complete uh, success would be around uh, there were about 14% failures and the patients who had uh, iop of uh, baseline iop presented at 29 mm of mercury they are the ones who in multi uh, variate analysis they found that they tend to fail so if they presenting with very high iop and rate presentation you don't have any history that means it's better not to do a needling if you want you could do it but uh, better to go for a secondary procedure directly so i have a question to you uh, did you compare in uh, the patients who had subscleral fibrosis versus a patient who had episcleral fibrosis because they say that the no we didn't do that no because the needling is more successful when it is episcleral if the scleral it is scleral, correct is completely fibrous and you know stark and yeah. space no scleral lake the needling may not be that yeah. So, you not that so that's why you have to look at the ostium just to see if it is open it will give much better results if it's closed then it won't give such good results also important Any to bring out the timing of needling because people can start doing it right away they should they cannot do it so they must understand as to what stage to ganesh tell that as well because it cannot be done in early phase the collagen has to mature for the for yeah animation. so correct uh, our uh, lag time was uh, minimum was about 4 months and the maximum was about uh, 29 months or so yeah so patients who uh, the, the only patient who had early needling was a patient who was on a, a prostaglandin analog which was causing a lot of hyperemia and we had to operate him without you know stopping the medication so that's one of the reasons uh, we had to operate on him for needling so early because he was on a PGA, which was causing a lot of hyperemia prior to the surgery, we didn't have opportunity to change it to a different PGA, a different medication. And it's not always surgical options are required. There are medical options for res for rescuing the failing bleb. So one needs to first recognize that in say a week, ten days, fifteen days, a month post of the bleb, which was a nice and healthy bleb, is now sinking. Is is the height is getting shallower, is getting smaller. or at the most a weeks time a lot of cost to vessels are coming up so these are the bleds which will fail so now here we can do certain things like step up steroids or we can use mitomycin c uh, subcutaneous tyvel just above the bleb that uh, 10 to 20 microns depend depending upon the uh, my microns only we call the thing na unit <laughs> 0.1 ml to 100 yeah, 0.1 microns. ml of that and give nice massage so first one should try to rescue the bleb only when it's not rescuable four months have gone Four, three to four months, minimum three months it is, and after that up to one year. I think this procedure does work. There's some reports people say even after two three years also it works. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I don't have experience of two three years. Beyond a year and two years, the the uh, the exception is the uh, rule. I mean, it's it's, a, it's exceptional for blebs to really get, get revived after many many years. But I think the best time period or window for these kind of needlings, at least in my hands, has been between six months to maybe at the most a year, mm. not longer than that. much much longer that totally scarred areas i think you can sort of try something but you know you know heart of hearts that it's not really going to lift up the uh, blood band uh, so on but how do you all people this is a different question how do you deal with an encysted blood exactly you notice that sometimes yeah. after surgery you will find a nice cystic tense looking blood so how would you all deal with that i am taking uh, the role of uh, sunita and dr vinod here <laughs> So again, I think we've managed conservatively first anti-glaucoma medication and steroids, and in fifty percent of the patients, it uh, may you know get resolved. But if it doesn't get resolved, then I think that's an indication for needling. And it blebs. Talk about needling. That's what I was asking. Yeah, needling is very successful yeah, in cystic because the yeah, it is it is the tenon cyst, and you have to just you know puncture it and remove all. Fibrosis. Sometimes the remodeling, as Dr. Madhu pointed out, the remodeling just gives some time with steroids and massage and observation. Yeah. Some of these things actually remodel and the bleb gets sort of sorted out and becomes diffuse again. Yeah. So I think the follow-up and observation is the key. You do need to look at it carefully. You need to identify various aspects of Cox II vessel, height of the bleb, extent of the bleb, intraocular pressure, and maybe even do a gonioscopy to look at the ostium. So I think it's a best left to a person who understands the post operative glaucoma situation and uh, so when you don't understand things maybe it's good to get a second opinion as to what is actually going on i think you are absolutely right if the patient is not able to follow up post operatively then i think all your efforts will go in vain because you have to really take good post operative care of these patients 
do you know laser suture lysis or remove releasable sutures or maybe needling so if you have lost that time then you cannot rescue the bleed so i think post operative follow ups are very very important i think that is one of the questions which we ask pre operatively to our patients whether they will be able to follow up at for 3 weeks post operatively yeah sometimes it is discussed that a primary glaucoma surgery is the answer for primary therapy for glaucoma and they say that the patient can't follow up and can't use medication so why not we operate on them and forget about it so i think that's a highly controversial topic as far as follow up is concerned you can't just operate on somebody and not see the patient at all and hope that he is not he doesn't come back for follow up i think follow up is a very very important aspect of uh, glaucoma surgical management maybe we can have one more session to look for the complications <laughs> and uh, how to avoid them because in 90 minutes we can't cover all the things just one last question probably because we are running short of time if we have to do second trabeculectomy what factors we look for suppose our first tb has failed after maybe after some time or we want to do second one what are the factors we look for like why do we need second trabeculectomy that's what you mean Suppose work one trabeculectomy work for two years, three years, and yes. now it's not working. Then what do you want to do? See, second trabeculectomy should be taken with a lot of caution, okay. unless and until all your medications and uh, is they have failed after trabeculectomy, then only we should consider trabeculectomy actually. Right. And uh, basically, is if you are not on target, the glaucoma is progressing. Then uh, second surgery, conjunct type has to be saved till till as much as you can. And so I have a comment to uh, make. Okay, yeah. If the first surgery has worked for a few years, and then it has failed, then there are chances that the second trabeculectomy may may work. But if the surgery has failed immediately, yeah. because of exuberant scarring, then there are chances that the surgery may not work. No, retrab, but you know, I think a retrab is less likely to work than the primary trab. The primary trab is probably yeah. the best chance for success. So, so the surgical success drops as you go to second trap and three traps and so on. So probably suppose you are an experienced glaucoma surgeon and you have say, the skill to do a glaucoma drainage device, you should probably consider a glaucoma drainage device as a second procedure rather than going on doing a retrap, which may which is more likely to fail also. Unless of course you are reasonably sure that you have good conjunctiva and you have you have a place where you can do the second trap. I would probably. But I think, of... Doctor Murli, for our audiences, because we have so many patients of angle closure glaucoma, yeah. and in angle closure glaucoma, fakey eyes. What do you advise as a second surgery? Yeah. If there is a little bit of cataract, I can smell the cataract. Yeah. I promise you, cataract <laughs> surgery. Yes, sir. Because I think all of us love to do yes. cataract surgery, so probably a cataract surgery would solve many of the problems, like improving the vision, dealing with the cataract. At the same time, reduce the intraocular pressure, deepen the anterior chamber, and so it's a wonderful surgery for the glaucoma and angle closure. So the cataract yes. surgery is wonderful. And of it's course, okay. when you have you supposed to have only a fake patient and you you don't have any option, then probably a retrab is okay because doing a tube in a fake patient is is a very difficult option. Yes. So therefore, fake or trab is the better option, no? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so in in eyes with angle closure, you could manage the uh, one eye which is progressing or more because it's usually asymmetric. You can do phaco trab in uh, the worse eye and do a phaco alone in the better eye. You would improve the quality of the life of the patient as well. I think we have already uh, crossed ninety minutes. Any questions? Any suggestion or any comments? All right. With this, we close the session. I would like to thank all the expert panelists, Dr. Sunita, and all expert panelists for this session. It was a wonderful session, and would like to have suggestion from the audience also how to improve it further. Maybe we can show more surgeries, more options. I think that will be a better idea, and different type of surgeries can be shown on the simultaneously. So, can be comparison can be done. What's your What's your take home? Should we improve it further or? Dr. Reena, would you like to suggest something? It is a wonderful initiative, and I hope the participants have benefited because it's a good way of looking at each step and discussing and knowing how anybody does it different from the others. And I think the important message everybody conveyed is not just the skill of doing a good surgery, 
but very important to follow up these patients at least for the first one month to have a good success, success of long-term IOP control and bleb uh, morphology. And as you're saying, Dr. Vinayad, I think congratulations to you, a very good initiative. And I hope the participants might be a, a good idea to take their feedback eventually to see how happy they were with the session, how much they learned from it. And we can evolve thereafter from their feedback. Maybe you could take up cataract with glaucoma in different situations, such as uh, the PECO traps, the SACS traps, and so on. So that's very commonly done nowadays. So I think most of us would like to know, most of the audience would like to know as to how to deal with common problems of coexisting cataract with glaucoma. No, that's a good idea. I think we can take up yeah. in the next couple of months. I think of all the glaucoma surgeries, combined the cataract and glaucoma is the most commonly performed cataract uh, glaucoma surgery. That's right. Right. Uh, so with this, we just close the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the audience. We're able to stay at, uh, this late with us. Good night. Good night to everyone. Thank, thank you. Good night. Good night for the invitation, sir. Thank you. Thank you all for involving us. Thank you. And thank, thank you. The audience, they were very, they, they were very participative. The audience were putting questions yeah. in the box. So thank you, audience. You were good. They asked a lot of questions. <laughs> a lot of questions. A lot of people are on YouTube also. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They can't post the questions, but whoever joined the Zoom link, they are posting questions. But a lot of people are there on the YouTube also. Thanks, so, Dr. Arora, for initiating this. It was really a wonderful session. Yeah. Thank Sunita, you. very well done. Great. Dr. Thank Arora, everybody. Thank you, Sunita, madam. Thank you, Arora, sir. Thank you. Uh, Navneet, you can make us offline. Navneet? Uh, yeah, just a moment, sir. Okay.